Well, thank you very much for having me today. It's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk about mesoscale analysis and the critical role that this physical sciences element plays in enhancing a weather-ready nation. Not only does this extend to the actual nominal products that we in the National Weather Service issue now for the sake of life and property protection, but also has the potential to expand our services even further as we go into the future, very much in line with the weather-ready nation concept. So let's get started by talking about what is mesoanalysis providing the support for? And this is going to be very much contextualized within, again, the Weather Ready Nation concept. When we're talking about Weather Ready Nation, we're talking about life and property protection from, people, from, from occurrences sensitive to hazardous weather, for instance. This is a major problem, certainly, that we within the Weather Enterprise need to be collaboratively working through as it has many different uh, members, many different facets, many different components, moving parts that all play a role in terms of enhancing weather readiness. What I'm talking about, not only the role of the National Weather Service in providing the official warnings and information dissemination in the time leading up to events, but partners within the National Weather Service talking about collaborations with their national center partners amongst local weather forecast offices, also within the community as far as emergency managers are concerned, getting the word out further and being on top of things as far as uh, preparedness and response is concerned. Uh, many elements of social sciences go into the messaging component of this. So it's very much an integrated concept here when we're talking about a weather-ready nation. And mesoanalysis provides such an important component to really supporting enhancements for impact-based decision support services within the time period that goes from, let's say, watch outlook scales to warning scales. So, so what am I saying here? Let's say that I told you that uh, this afternoon in such a place, that, uh, such and such a time and place, that there's a 30% chance of showers and thunderstorms this afternoon at some location. Well, that might be good information, but how effective can that be to uh, partners, emergency managers, superintendents, et cetera, making decisions based on that information alone? There's a lot more information that we can provide leveraging the physical sciences to providing that foundation for actionable information, information that can affect change so that people are able to take the necessary steps for life and property protection. That goes right into the IDSS purview. Effectively being able to provide much more specificity and fluidity and uh, if you want to say tactical threat assessment that goes into decision making. Because if I'm telling you there's just a 30% chance of showers and thunderstorms versus we're looking at the 4 to 5 p.m. time frame when there could be an outside chance of a tornadic storm in the area most likely scenario is not much happens, but be ready. We're providing a lot more specificity that can go into actionable consequences amongst our partners so that they can do what they need to do in order to protect life and property. Because that level of specificity, while I know some might be concerned about how specific can we be, it is very much founded under a very vast array of, of research and operational experience across many different components um, of the weather enterprise. And so I'm going to be talking about how we build together this community knowledge, the deep physical sciences, for really enhancing our ability to, to get the word out and fill in that critical information gap that has been traditionally associated with that time period between get the forecast out, a, a, a more regular set of product dissemination, and then straight to warning time. There's a lot of information that we could be providing within that time period intervening between watch and outlooks and forecasts and actual warning time that people can use for uh, life and property protection. So what we're getting at is really the physical science of foundation for transitioning the National Weather Service operating model from something that's a much more, um, if you want to say, rigid, product-centric, schedule-driven cycle to one that is much more flexible, fluidly evolving, and very much in line with providing information that gets right at actionable information for decision making. So what are some of the goals that come out with this application here um, within the Weather Ready Nation uh, paradigm idea? 
it, you know, it's important that if we're going to close this gap between watches and outlooks and warnings, for instance, that we're able to identify and communicate potential hazards at longer lead times than we ever have been able uh, before and with greater specificity as well to promote weather readiness. Now, certainly, time and space scales are inherently li uh, linked together, and so the farther we go out in time prior to a potential event, the less direct targeted, like say storm scale, we can provide. But that said, we still can provide very targeted information with an hour, two hour long time period so that let's say that we have someone who's running a fair or those who are working at hospitals, they might need more than just standard lead times for tornado warnings, severe thunderstorm warnings, for them to take their, their necessary precautions into play to uh, you know, protect the people that they're responsible for. And so how are we able to really push the limits when it comes to specificity and messaging uh, not only longer lead times, but also at a much more targeted scale than we ever have before to promote that weather readiness. But this is a major challenge because as we go to longer lead times, there's inherently much more uncertainty, or you know, pretty much inherent to a wide array of very complex physical interactions that occur at you know the storm scale, the mesoscale, that many of which are not even resolved by basic observational networks by uh, numerical weather prediction model guidance. Not only are the processes not fully resolvable, but there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the forecasts, in the exact ob observation representation of initial conditions. And so when we're talking about longer lead times that are necessary for weather readiness, there's going to be a lot more uncertainty. So it really requires us as a uh, as, as in a full organization, as, as a community, to shift from deterministic categorical assessments as, as much as we might be used to doing that to thinking in terms of probability density functions. What are all the possible outcomes that can come to fruition? What's most likely? What's a reasonable worst case scenario? For those of you at coastal offices who are familiar with the uh, storm surge percent exceedance concept, if we're just communicating the most likely scenario, then we have the potential to miss out on providing readiness for a major, major impact from some of the reasonable worst case scenarios. That's why we do incorporate 10% uh, exceedance, 20% exceedance, et cetera, into the messaging component of storm surge. We can think about things very analogously when we're addressing reasonable worst case scenarios for convective episodes. I actually show um, this example here across uh, my old CWA there in a the Topeka, Kansas, CWA, serving North Central, Northeast, East Central, Kansas. This was a convective event that eventually gave rise to the duck boat incident there in the Missouri Ozarks area. I had a great fortune of having the opportunity to work with the amazing team there at the Topeka Forecast Office on this very challenging event. It really came out of a very, very low predictability, warm advection regime as a mid-level speed max was carrying EML out over the lower elevations, uh, atop the lower elevations of the eastern central plains vicinity. There was certainly a wide disparity amongst CAMs and just overall numerical weather prediction guidance whether we would get any generation of convection whatsoever, but a very conditionally favorable environment. So you can see while we had ongoing convection in Missouri, for this event, which had very low predictability, if we had enough, enough collisions of convective counterparts in north central Kansas that could give rise to an eastward and eventually southeastward elongating cold pool amidst a favorable deep shear and a favorable environmental parameter space for, uh, for thermodynamically speaking, we'd have the potential for more of a duration, but that would have to come out of a very low predictability, you know, DAVA pattern on the upstream side of a mid-level wave, uh, very weak warm advection. You'd have to really depend on enough cell interactions to come about to force the uh, amalgamation of cold pools uh, we use the concept here of pancake batter to kind of conceptualize what's going on here. Well, you know, there's all these moving parts that have to come together for this to work out. And even as you can see, the reflectivity losing organization, at the same time we're producing 70 to 90 mile an hour winds in an extended swath, 
we're not dealing with something that's very highly predictable. So while the most likely scenario for this event might have been one that was just a very uh, obnoxiously warm, humid day in northeast Kansas, a reasonable worst case scenario would be much worse. And unless we start to really identify those, those gotcha events, the events that have low predictability but lots of potential, it's going to be really tough unless we start to acknowledge those to be able to anticipate and be prepared because once you fall behind the messaging, it's very hard to catch up. What does mesoanalysis do? It provides a reproducible physical sciences-based method for identifying the the, the entire spectrum of, of, of contingencies, everywhere from a most likely scenario to reasonable worst and best, best case scenarios. And so this idea of, of, of leveraging mesoanalysis for, for providing much more tactical severe weather threat assessment within that time period between, say, 30% chance of showers and thunderstorms, then straight to, you know, watch, and then, you know, conditions are favorable, then straight to just a few minutes before the event. There's so much messaging we, that we can provide in that intervening time scale at a much more tactical manner than we ever have been able to do before. This is the idea of bridging the watch warning gap, which is vital for key decision making. N some people need a lot more time. Some of our partners and customers need a lot more time for decision making, and even if there's uncertainty, we can resolve that and message that. Here's an example of Graphicast that we used, um, or, or could be used rather, I should say, for that uh, event in North Central, Northeast East Central Kansas, showing a ta targeted threat area um, with a most likely situation um, being, uh, you know, one that there's a lot of uncertainty for. You know, there's no guarantee in this initial outlook over here. Um, that we're going to necessarily have severe storms, but we're saying that there's an area of greatest potential with a lot of uncertainty. And when we have that fluidly evolving mesoscale environment and watching the detailed evolution of the convection within that environment, we can provide much more targeted with much more lead time information getting out ahead of uh, potentially very damaging severe weather and really push the limits as far as lead times and messaging at, even outside the more rigid formal product uh, structure and its, and its schedule um, because there are opportunities with various social media platforms, messaging with an NWS chat, um, other types of ways of, of, of getting the word out and kind of resolving the uncertainty and, and, and using the mesoscale environment to identify what could go wrong or how things could be uh, you know, evolving much more safely in a reasonable best case scenario. This is all stuff that we could be providing communications for. So that gets into the motivation for this initiative that was principally led by the Operations Proving Ground uh, there in Kansas City involving a large collaborative group from the Storm Prediction Center in Norman to the weather, various weather forecast offices uh, from participants as well as facilitators. Uh, NOAA PMO, uh, PMO office was involved in this as well. Um, many different components, some chief learning officer, at National Weather Service Training Center. Really, this was very much a collaborative pro uh, project that we were all getting involved in as far as looking at this from a proof of concept, as far as how we can leverage the physical sciences as well as social sciences from the messaging component to really being able to enhance IDSS specifically for convection. And really, again, the idea here are what are some of the solutions that can we invest that we can invest in for really closing that watch warning gap and providing that enhanced messaging really lies within the idea of championing meso, expert mesoscale analysis. This is very important for promoting much more collaboration, effective collaboration between the Storm Prediction Center and the Weather Forecast Offices across the National Weather Service, leveraging physical sciences to enhance situational awareness of the environment. Again, it's this continuous flow of tactical information. This is very much within the FACETS paradigm. We're providing a lot more continuously updating information that's much more targeted and much more able to address the uncertainty and the evolving uncertainty as we head into potentially dangerous events or lack thereof. You know, again, solutions for closing this watch warning gap, providing clear, precise, actionable intelligence. Not just 30% chance of showers and storms, there's only so much that people can do with that information. And when we're able to much provide much more targeted information, we really can get it in the back of people's heads, the various amounts of readiness that they should be instituting into their plans to protect life and property. Um, now, this also has the potential to infuse enhancements in convective warning performance. 
ultimately convection is, uh, you know, breathing, inhaling in the environment in which it is evolving and exhaling or producing the hazards that are going to be a function of its mesoscale environment. So if we understand the environment better, we can better understand the range of possibilities and anticipate rather than react to convective trends. As a result, we have the potential to improve lead times for the anticipation and probability of detection, encourage a lot more strategic decisions when it comes to polygon placement, and also be able to really rule out environmentally unfavorable areas from the FAR perspective as well, as there might be some marginal signatures at times that are not evolving in, it, or that are not evolving in favorable environments, and this allows us to really think about things kind of in the bigger picture as far as what are the hazards that can be produced by convection that's feeding on a particular environment. Now, this is a very exciting uh, concept as well as it very much leverages the concept of R2O and O2R, very important synergistic feedback between research to operations and operations to research. This is an example of a couple of mesoscale discussions that I issued during the time that I was at SPC, back when we did heavy rainfall MDs prior to um, having the Weather Prediction Center issue the mesoscale precipitation discussions. And this is actually for the Miami area. Um, really was a very interesting example of a long-lived, nearly stationary supercell structure that dumped, you know, tons and tons of rain over uh, areas of downtown Miami, locations adjacent to Biscayne Bay actually resulted in a paper that uh, meteorologist in charge Pablo Santos here at the Miami office and I had, had really used to study this mesoscale environment supporting East Coast area flood events and then involved a lot of numerical modeling and then, you know, are able to apply that back into operations, really completing that whole R2O, O2R feedback loop that goes into getting into the detail, you know, rolling up the sleeves and getting in the detail of the actual environment to be able to address the potential for these, you know, high impact but low predictability type events to actually occur. And it's really exciting how there's a great linkage as we get into the deep, intricate details here of really having that important marriage between research and operations components of the weather enterprise here. Ultimately, there are so many different responsibilities at the Weather Forecast Office that fall on uh, meteorologists during, uh, during severe weather convective events. Everything from aviation to warning forecaster positions, DSS, mesoanalysis is typically lumped in a lot of different other responsibilities. But until we actually take the time to dedicate resources to the very deep dive that's necessary for the detailed assessment relevant for addressing convective behavior and the heterogeneities in the environment that can really manifest itself in subtleties in the mass field but have significant bearing on convective initiation and convective evolution and intensity, it's going to be tough to be able to give the credit that it deserves for addressing the near-term tactical threat assessment involved in mesoanalysis-based threat assessment for severe weather. And so it really requires, if you, if you want to think of this as a mesoscale analysis, if you want to say review of how we've been doing it and identifying ways that we can do it better into the future to really have a reproducible, repeatable manner for enhancing IDSS and leveraging the physical sciences as such. How do we do this? Well, at the, at the um, operations proving ground, the OPG there, we had gathered a mesoanalyst think tank of uh, expert mesoanalysts across the agency. Um, there in Kansas City brought uh, science and operations officers and other individuals not only to the think tank, but also involving Storm Prediction Center in the delivery and facilitation of the boot camps to really identify science and service gaps and best practices for performing convective-related impact-based decision support services. We work together through the think tank and leading up to the mesoanalyst boot camps to create hands-on, job-relevant, collaborative opportunities for problem-solving and ways in which we can really push the science forward to really fit uh, within the Weather Readiness, Weather Ready Nation concept. Really connecting learning, uh, the experience of training and displaced real-time training to improving job performance. And this really was also an opportunity to evaluate the viability of actually supporting this paradigm shift and pushing the limit. How able are we to do this? How, how far can we push the limits with the physical sciences and the social sciences and the various institutional knowledge that we already have 
to build upon that, how, how well can we actually, you know, have this work out? So we effectively, as a part of this, created a team of mesoanalyst specialists, field ambassadors uh, within the OPG mesoanalyst boot camp that we would then, you know, bring into this immersive experience that I'm going to talk much more about and then have WFO forecasters and, and, and even some SUs come and be a part of this immersive experience and effectively bring it back to their local offices to, to spread the word, to spread the concept, and serve in a vital role of leadership to really bring to life the concepts that we address here. So throughout the spring and summer, this, again, this was, some, this was a program that we had tremendous support across the agency, across the regions, the regional headquarter offices. I um, want to give a special shout out to everyone at Storm Prediction Center, the Topeka Weather Forecast Office, and here at the National Weather Service in Miami. I was very fortunate to have been one of the facilitators and leaders in this initiative, and it's taken a lot of work to be, to be putting this together, organizing this, and I really appreciate all the support from everyone at the offices that I've worked at. And there are many others who have been key uh, facilitators uh, and, 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 and leaders in this initiative who all uh, work together to put on this, the, the three week long proof of concept experiments in spring of summer involving displaced real time simulations, increasing with complexity through the week. We simulated weather forecast office operations by applying mesoanalysis data sets and the physical, physical sciences com complex conceptual models to really perform severe weather threat assessment and, and, and the corresponding messaging by pushing the limits of how uh, you know, much lead time can we get out there in the messaging. You know, not just warning decision making, but getting the messaging to a actionable information, actionable intelligence that uh, partners can use. Enhancing the precision in time and space, messaging the uncertainty, and providing much more fluid information. Again, we have 10 WFO forecasters and, 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 and Sue's as well involved in this uh, per session. Uh, Storm Prediction Center lead forecaster Rich Thompson came to each of these sessions to serve as a key primary facilitator as well. Um, other subject matter experts, emergency manager uh, from one of the counties in eastern Kansas actually was very, uh, we were very fortunate to have his um, the incorporation of, of his viewpoint and perspective uh, being one of the vital partners to the National Weather Service. And this really was able to provide a lot of direct feedback and discussion and guidance that we were able to build amongst these, uh, these, these, these different episodes, these different experiments. Ultimately, a, um, a, a full report, an executive report was put together by director of OPG, Kim Runk, and these included findings and recommendations that were sent to Weather Service leadership in October that you can certainly reference more. So this, this entire experience really brought the multi, multiple dimensions of the entire training, R2O, R2, um, O2R linkages, together with the messaging and the services element. So it's, it's really this very, very expansive, diverse, uh, program that we really we really pulled together here. And so I'm showing some images here um, from some of the examples of the, the technical expertise that we built into this. You can kind of see the image here uh, that was taken. We uh, tried to illustrate the use of photographs for performing um, convective behavior threat assessment as far as how do storm splits materialize as a function of the interaction between an updraft and the vertical wind shear profile that we can gauge from the hodograph and implied vortex tubes and inflow that we modeled with straws and cups for the updrafts and chocolates for the resultant perturbation pressure patterns that could influence the storm splits and dominant cells, et cetera. And so we really tried to take the very, very complex theoretical models and, and really provide a lot of hands-on training, explanation, and guidance. There was a tremendous amount of prerequisite material that went into this. A lot of time was also spent reviewing that material. Um, you can kind of see some of the examples. Not only did the students have to go through uh, a lot of different training from the uh, Storm Prediction Center Severe Thunderstorm Forecasting Video Lecture Series, but also the Forecasting Organized Severe Storm Video Lecture Series that I had put together with the Operations Proving Ground, Kim Runk there. They, uh, we, we reviewed the material, had them address these questions in a past event of actually having to apply their uh, training and their prerequisite study into actually performing a convective mode assessment, the tendency for convection to be ingesting surface-based effective 
uh, surface-based effects of infolayer air, for instance, and um, actually went through performing analyses and performing, performing related IDSS enhancements really getting into how can we take a visible satellite loop like this one here and be able to address all the different static stability stratifications that exist within a targeted area, being able to identify that we're dealing with more stable billow clouds out over here with more texturization, curv curvilinear properties indicated here showing a gradual destabilization process and then evolving into HCRs and other areas and the implications on the static stability in the boundary layer and the, and the wind profile in the boundary layer and then looking at other areas where there's more agitation to Q fields organized along quasi-linear boundaries, et cetera, and where can we really target the greatest likelihood of convection to ingest um, the boundary layer of uh, a profile that's, that's going to be characterized by both buoyant parcels as well as ones that, with lots of streamwise vorticity. And how can we take just a visible satellite loop alone like this and be able to identify targeted areas of most potent, conditionally favorable severe weather environments? And, and, and really perform that at a very targeted tactical scale. It's really exciting stuff that we can do with that. And, and not only that, but be able to work within the, the, the outlook scales that are uh, provided by national centers. You know, this is an example of a convective outlook that shows two marginal risk areas. Both um, are of the same categorical, de categorical designation, but the actual spectrum of possibilities and the messaging within each of each of these areas can vary considerably. And so this is a fantastic guidance, necessary guidance for effectively sculpting the forecast funnel, for instance, and getting the targeted areas at a somewhat broader scale here in terms of getting offices alerted, getting key partners alerted about potential threats, and then being able at the local office to be able to decompose the messaging, the contingency scenarios, the most likely scenarios, the, the, the ones that are reasonable worst cases that could vary between, say, Arizona and North Dakota here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. Let's say that we have a probability density function for the previous outlook for Arizona that looks something like this. This is, again, just an arbitrary conceptualized probability density function. You can see that for that marginal risk area, there's a most likely scenario that if you want to think about impacts being on the x-axis, uh, to the left is lower impacts higher impacts to the right. Say for the Arizona scenario, we're dealing with just typical weak shear pulse convective modes, weakly organized multicellular structures offering a low end uh, wet microburst or, or hybrid, hybrid microburst type threat in, in Arizona that change, you know, the overall, uh, if you want to say hybrid, high predictability of a, a relatively modest impact type of severe weather threat is not going to change a whole lot between uh, an initial time and, and the peak of the diurnal heating cycle. Whereas in our North Dakota case, we might have the exact, exact same most likely scenario, again with marginal risk, showing a most likely scenario that is consistent with lower impacts, but corresponding probability densities that are higher for higher end impacts. In other words, the standard deviation of the distribution for North Dakota possibilities also includes higher probability weights at more uh, significant potential impacts, but the predictability and uncertainty is much higher in the North Dakota regime, rendering a lower peak, uh, if you want to say peak uh, probability, or I should say uh, lower impact for that peak probability for North Dakota. However, with time, as we get closer to the convective event, the probability density function will be evolving for the North Dakota case while staying the same for the Arizona case, where we might see storms beginning to develop, towers develop, say, just across the border in southern Canada over the Canadian prairies. And in this particular case, our most likely impact may be actually shifting to something that is of a higher end impact than it was previously, unlike the Arizona case. And the shifting of the distribution is going to be very much addressed within the mesoscale environment. But it's this shifting, it's these traits, character traits of the individual probability density functions that are directly what falls into the detailed analysis, the mesoscale analysis, 
directly serves as a vital pillar for. And that's why it's so, you know, that's why the Board of the Forecast Office plays such a vital role in identifying and messaging the various character of the PDFs, the various character of reasonable worst case scenarios, that how they can differ from most likely scenarios, et cetera, so that we can provide the messaging and give a heads up about how things could evolve that are different than the most likely, for instance. And a big challenge in, incorporated into all of this is the communications element. You know, being able to talk about elements of uncertainty and poor predictability is a major challenge. And partnering, partnering with uh, emergency managers, and I mentioned emergency manager uh, Johnson County, Kansas, uh, this is Trent here, he was played a vital role in being able to uh, explain how emergency managers are able to um, receive the information and what types of information are going to be more well received or, or, or you know or, or, or much more actionable than, than others and really highlighting the importance of leveraging various venues like NWS chat or mesoscale AFDs to provide much more technical expertise, building credibility, and providing the reasonable worst case scenarios and contingencies for that, you know, effectively the, the, the what part of the for, excuse me, the why part of the forecast and how that can manifest itself in variations on the what, especially as we go down the, you know, down the pike in the couple to few hours out from the actual occurrence of impacts. Not only did we have that element uh, where we were really bringing in the communications concept in terms of the messaging, how we get the word out, how we have the meta-analysis translate to um, enhancing IDSS, but we actually built in the concept of displaced real-time training, certainly to multiple cases that we went through, but actually had types of events that were fully simulated. I think that this is an example of a, a North Dakota, uh, from the North Dakota case of a state fair where we had critical weather thresholds and we tasked the teams with performing IDSS and providing a continuous stream of information to partners that were able to effectively, you know, evaluate how well the uh, participants in the Weather Forecast Office were able to translate the meso-analysis information through writing targeted information to our partners at, a, at, at time and space scales that we really haven't been able to provide that level of precision uh, before. Uh, so key takeaways, I have a list here, and this again is in the executive report that I encourage everyone to check out if you're interested in learning more. I'm going to highlight some of the important ones that, you know, the many important ones, but some of the uh, particular ones that are going to be relevant for some of the upcoming slides is the important role that mesoanalysis plays in enhancing situational awareness and threat assessment. Ultimately, this is very important in highly conditional threat areas. If you guys might remember the, the, the Chapman, Kansas tornado, this was a tornado that occurred from a long-lived supercell um, in part of north central northeast Kansas. Very conditionally favorable environment for tornadic storms, but large-scale ascent was, was very dirty, very, very much a lack of large-scale ascent. So the predictability of any storm development was very limited in that case. In fact, there are a lot of signs pointing that redevelopment in an environment that was augmented, whose wind profile was augmented by earlier round of convection, there was a lot of uncertainty whether or not we would have recovery in the right spot for convective redevelopment, and so by identifying favorable environments, by getting in the details as far as what might be the instigation for subsequent convective development is going to be key for identifying how things could go wrong, how, how the forecast could vary for most likely. And mesoanalysis provides that critical component of situational awareness. And it also really helps to craft the, the probability density functions, help us really identify or resolve the PDFs that go into, uh, that can be used to, to, uh, through synthesis into appropriate messaging to our partners. Uh, this is an important role for shifting our mindset towards more anticipation rather than reacting to trends. Anticipating the trends so that we can stay ahead of them, so we can get the word out, so that people are able to, even in the face of uncertainty, be able to have actionable intelligence to protect life and property. Um, you know, the, this whole, uh, entire, um, you know, evaluation experiment really showed the importance of experiential education, hands-on displaced real-time training, and having honest feedback to really accelerate the learning. This really highlights the need for an office culture that is very open to communication 
critical to successful implementation of these, of these ideas. What I'm getting at this is that office culture, being able to be receptive, being patient with other viewpoints, having respectful discussions, having an open mind, being willing to talk amongst one another in a respectful environment are vital. That cultural component of the office is absolutely vital if we're going to take steps that involve pushing the limits with the science that's already there to enhancing our services. The culture element is absolutely vital, and that was absolutely brought up across the board um, as, as takeaways from these, uh, from these evaluations. So how can we take this back to the local forecast office? A couple pictures from the Topeka office as well as uh, the Miami forecast office. Let's take this outlook, an excellent outlook from the Storm Prediction Center in the bottom left here showing a broad marginal risk area extending from southern portions of the Mid-Atlantic region all the way through the South Florida counties as well as the Florida Keys as well. However, we know that within broader risk areas, even at the meso-alpha scale, there are sub-synoptic, sub-meso-alpha scale, even smaller scale heterogeneities in the mass fields that can render differences in the relative threat areas, the relative threats of different hazards within that broader area. And at a local office, we have a great opportunity to be able to resolve the threat that's provided by our key players within the National Center community and be able to provide that at a very targeted tactical scale at the local office to very much provide IDSS. So this is an example of a graphic cast that uh, we had actually issued uh, at the Miami Forecast Office showing that within the broader marginal risk area, there's a very targeted zone of upcoming threat area, a lot of uncertainty, but we're keeping an eye on that part of South Florida from Mainland Monroe County through uh, Miami-Dade County up to downtown Miami, Biscayne Bay uh, vicinity for an area that's going to feature not only the large uh, mesoscale ascent associated with uh, differential heating and resultant solar nodal circulations, and you can see the agitated Q on the warm side of that differential heating zone, but also an area of convection just offshore that could be advancing through that area experiencing greater surface space destabilization, and then provide a summary of all of that in a technically worded mesoscale ASD. While certainly that technical detail can't be provided, um, you know, in, in, in our more public forms of messaging, there's an important role that, that, that can be played, and so our media partners, our emergency managers, those who want to know more about the why have a great outlet for, for, for seeing that. And we're really able to provide those heterogeneities when the broader outlook scale at the targeted small scale tactical threat assessment with the fluidly evolving time scales that really get down to an hour or two before uh, severe weather is, 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 is happening. And we have a great opportunity at the WFO to really leverage those concepts. I want to show an example here from the Miami Forecast Office of how we're actually, you know, implementing this here at the local office. This is uh, in uh, leading up to the um, a Super Bowl. I believe this was a night or two before the Super Bowl. We had a, a line of severe thunderstorms. The Storm Prediction Center issued a, an excellent severe thunderstorm watch covering some of our South Florida counties and the Florida Keys. Uh, this is uh, one of our forecasters here who is actually putting together an enhanced short-term weather outlook before warnings were even being issued in Miami-Dade County. You can actually see him putting that together. We got a picture right as he's putting that together. Here's what was sent out on Twitter. So we're giving a heads up. We're bridging that watch warning gap. We're giving a heads up to our people out in the Everglades area, right up to the western side of the Miami metropolitan area. Even before we're drawing up the warning, we're using the mesoscale environment to craft how far north we should go with a threat area, how far east. We're considering convective mode and the tendency for surface-based hazards to continue and, and, and getting that word out, providing that, that, that pre-alert information, or I should say pre-warning alert, and then, and then you could see the warning that we're issuing after that, that pre-warning alert goes out. We're able to very much extend the information distribution so it doesn't go straight from severe thunderstorm watch, hours go by, and then now you have 10 minutes for, for, for taking shelter. We're able to bridge that gap before we're drawing up a polygon here, as you can see here at the Miami Forecast Office. Again, we're going to start to summarize this now. I want to reiterate the main point here. A weather-ready nation is not a weather-reactive nation. 
If we're just waiting for the uh, going from 30% chance of showers and storms to waiting for the circulation that produced the Haverhill, Florida tornado back in July of this past year for which signatures don't become apparent until right as the phenomenon is actually occurring, then we're missing a tremendous opportunity to really enhance weather readiness. Again, if we're just reacting, we're not promoting re readiness. A weather ready nation is not a weather reactive nation. This requires for weather readiness us to have an anticipatory, not a reactive stance. The more specificity that we can provide than many traditional forecast products is, is available and leverageable from mesoanalysis, which allows us an opportunity to provide a continuous flow of targeted tactical information to support decision makers. And the identification, we're living within a world of uncertainty, but that's okay. We can message accordingly, most likely, reasonable worst, reasonable best case outcomes, those contingencies, providing a means for our communicating probabilistic information. And we really need to move on from the deterministic type of messaging. Ultimately, the science foundation is there and it's just waiting to be leveraged. And we're already doing that across the board. This is absolutely vital. So being able to anticipate complex convective behavior that feeds both into the messaging as well as enhancing the watch warning advisory program. Mesoanalysis is the physical sciences foundation for accomplishing this. I want to thank everyone. This has been a national scale team that has been involved in this, involving all, involving all the various regions, many players across the board. I want to thank the Storm Prediction Center again. Topeka Forecast Office, the Miami Forecast Office for having me be involved in this. Many, many key players were involved in this. This is a group from the first Mesoanalyst Bootcamp. And I want to thank all the participants. All of you played so much of a role in completing the prerequisite material, providing vital contributions, discussions. We had many vibrant discussions throughout this process. It was a fantastic opportunity uh, working with NISL and other groups as well uh, to really drive these points home. The second group, as you can see over here, going into June, many fantastic participants across the board uh, involved in this initiative. And then lastly, here was our final group here of the Mezzo Analyst Bootcamp participants. With that, I think we have about 15 minutes for any questions that you may have. And the executive report is available. If you're interested, feel free to contact Kim Runk or myself for uh, more details on that. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. Um, we have time for some questions. If you do have questions, uh, please uh, post them in the uh, group chat. Um, in the meantime, um, I, that was a fantastic presentation. I really um, think you hit the, the nail on the head um, talking about of anticipating evolution of convection, um, especially in an IDSS world, being able to anticipate it and not just react. And to be able to do that, you have to understand um, not just the environment in which um, a threat is evolving, but also understand the conceptual models um, of convection or whatever threat that you're dealing with um, and how that uh, may evolve so that that way you can um, give in I think you call it actual, actionable intelligence uh, to the decision makers um, and give them enough lead time. I know out here in Salt Lake, uh, we deal with uh, flash flooding in the national parks down in southern Utah quite a bit. And, you know, when we issue warnings, that doesn't actually do a whole lot because the threat is already um, evolving or the the flood is already ongoing. Uh, for the parks to have any um, chance to do anything with that, they need a significant amount of lead time. And that basically requires us to assess the environment as opposed to uh, just issuing wa uh, warnings and drawing boxes around storms. Um, do you guys have any uh, plans to host uh, more of these mesoanalysis boot camps uh, going forward? Uh, yes, very good question. Now, there's been a lot of work being done for uh, targeting uh, very, you know, different divisions within the Weather Service, different uh, interest groups. Um, there's, there's certainly more work being done to kind of ex expand the reach. I want to, some exciting initiatives within our uh, Marine East uh, sub-region of Southern Region. Uh, we're actually, uh, myself along with Pete Wolf, uh, the Sioux there at the Jacksonville Forecast Office, were effective taking this material and providing a spin-off uh, workshop and, 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 and two-day episodes to uh, offices from Mobile, Alabama, eastward through Tallahassee to Jacksonville, southward to Tampa, Melbourne, Miami, San Juan, Key West, and effectively tailoring this type of material for the local office 
uh, more typical regimes, climatological patterns uh, there with the founda same foundational material across the board. And so really in terms of, you know, targeting different groups within the agency, um, is it, certainly uh, and certainly more work being done more at the national scale, you know, with OPG and, and collaborating entities. It's, it's all ongoing right now. So a lot of exciting uh, concepts still continue. Very good. We do have a question here from uh, Julie Adolson. Uh, what is the best way for WFOs to communicate this gap info to their IDSS partners? Julie, that is a fantastic question. I, I'm really glad you asked that. We, we experimented with a lot of, of, of different means, everywhere from um, NWS chat messages to mesoscale AFDs. I think at various times uh, we would simulate discussions with our emergency manager and, and, and other people playing in, in role-playing modes. It, it, it became very apparent that NWS chat is a very vital uh, means for having that conversation with our uh, with our partners, um, being able to provide the the why more of the why that is met for the needs or, or or is able to meet the needs of the individual partners that we're discussing with. Now it's great to be able to also issue mesoscale AFDs as that is going to be information that could be used by a wide range of audience. Not everyone can be in the, on NWS chat. And so being, by effectively leveraging different platforms, the Mesoscale AFD, the NWS chat, that, that is, that is, those are excellent ways of partner engagement. But ultimately, leveraging social media and being able to really you know, build upon that, that, that instrument for information dissemination, using our website, for instance, uh, are also very important, and, and certainly calls to, to, to EMs when there's specific events that are being hosted that we need to provide watch out for. So I, I don't want to say there's necessarily one that's better than everything else, but, but there are certainly different uh, instruments for different circumstances, and, 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 and I hope I address those appropriately. Let me know if I can provide any follow-up. Okay, well, it looks like uh, unless we have any other additional questions, um, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Cohen for his time. Uh, this uh, presentation will be uh, uploaded onto YouTube in the next uh, week or so. Ryan Ellis uh, takes care of that for us. So anyways, I appreciate everybody's participation and thank you again, uh, Dr. Cohen, for taking the time to, to talk to us. Thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone's attention today and for joining. Thank you.